Welcome back, everybody, to the Practical Woodsman podcast. I'm Rut, the creator and host of the Practical Woodsman. That's right. It's my very tired genius, which brought this all into existence. It's a little late here where I'm at, but we're going to do this show. I wanted to ask you what you think about the desert. Do you think you'd do all right in the desert? What if things really went south in the desert? Think you'd do all right then? Well, in this episode of the Practical Woodsman podcast, I'm going to take you along with me. We're going to get in a time machine. We're going to go back to 1994, and I'm going to tell you a story about the desert, a really fascinating story of survival. But before we get into all that, we got to do the musical introduction to get us all in the mood, winkity, winkity. So let's get that out of the way. I'll be right here when it ends. couple of announcements before we get started. Why don't you consider joining uh, the Practical Woodsman online community, exclusive online community, over at thepracticalwoodsman.locals.com, L-O-C-A-L-S.com. Or you can just download the really nifty locals.com app from the App Store and then search for The Practical Woodsman Within. I do live streams there on saturdays when i'm able also if you ain't subscribed to the practical woodsman on youtube or rumble and let's say it this way youtube and rumble because one of these days rumble is going to be the place to be they're going to it's going to be better than youtube so you might as well get used to using it now and get subscribed to the Practical Woodsman over there. But if you're not already subscribed to those channels, those video channels, consider it. I do several different types of shows. This is the podcast, and this show is meant to do just as fine as an audio-only show as it is a video show. But then I've got Adventures. That's me actually out in the backcountry doing real woodsman stuff. Uh, and you got to see that in video. You, audio is not going to do you any good for that. Uh, and I've also got exclusive videos, which are just things that I like to show off. For example, uh, this week I, I showed you how to make a, an ancient oil lamp. Real simple. I, I'm not going to spoil it here. Go over, subscribe to The Practical Woodsman on YouTube and Rumble to see that video. And I do shorts, uh, video shorts on youtube so if you're only a subscriber here to the audio please consider subscribing to the videos channels all right i'm going to attempt to say a word in french and it goes like this de marathon de sable i don't know if i'm saying that correctly and i'm not making fun of the french language by the way i'm making fun of myself not being able to speak french But what it means is the sand marathon or the sands marathon. Uh, The sand marathon sounds better to me since in English the word sand can be singular or plural. The sand marathon, it's a grueling multi-stage race held nowhere else except for the Sahara Desert in Morocco. The official website for the race describes it as a quote unquote self sufficient adventure. For their whole week in the desert, competitors have to carry all their own equipment and food, and they're penalized for exceeding their designated rations. So imagine you get three M and M's and two peanuts and one snack pack. You you get more than that, you're out of the race. I don't know what it is exactly, but that's what that's the way it goes. You get penalized for exceeding what somebody else designates as your rations. Can you imagine being out in the mountains somewhere, like on the fifth day, and you're starving to death, and 
you're ready to eat a whole raccoon for yourself and somebody pops out of the bushes and says that 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 you can't do that you can't that's exceed your rations well that's kind of what this race is all about they also have a minimum pace of 1.86 miles now if you think that 1.86 miles per hour sounds funny that's because it was in kilometers and i had to uh, change it over to miles so 1.86 miles three kilometers per hour they have to cover that in the desert the sahara desert in morocco now while roughly two miles per hour might not sound too bad when you consider that the Sahara's terrain, which is roughly the same size as China, consists of uneven sand, salt flats, gravel plains, well, then the journey, as you can imagine, becomes all the more difficult. Then there's the average temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 30 degrees Celsius. Got to factor that in. And you know what it's uh, made even worse by? The lack of rainfall. That's right, it's a desert. Plant life is scarce, so much so that the chance of participants of the marathon encountering any plants is very low. So now we're going to get into our time machine. I told you there was going to be a time machine. You and I are going to hop into this time machine and go back in time to 1994. There's somebody I want to introduce you to. His name's Mauro Prosperi. Mauro is about to do this sand marathon I've been telling you all about. So, poof, we're there. We've just traveled back to 1994. People were wearing jams. Uh, let's see. Grunge music is all the rage. What else? Square box televisions. There's no flat televisions yet. No real cell phones. Not the kinds we know. Internet's just starting to take off. And here we are. Out in the Sahara Desert. In Morocco. Where they're about to do this. Sand Marathon. Take a look around. What do you what do you notice? Well, it's hot, isn't it? It's very hot. Absolutely nowhere to get out of the sun, so we're being blasted by the desert's direct, unrelenting sunlight. And it's sandy, of course. In fact, you're brushing your eyes right now with your finger because you just got some grit blown into them by the breeze. Another thing you might notice is that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of people competing in this thing. You see that as you look around? In fact, looks like there's fewer than 100 individuals out here wanting to do this thing. But wait. Wait a second. You recognize that feller right over there. You see him? That's the guy I was just telling you about. That's Mauro Prosperi. You step out of the way as the participants of this thing all walk by you to line up. What luck. It looks like we got here just in time to see this thing start to take off. And there they go. They're all trotting off at an easy jog. Don't you think the enormity of this desert makes them look awfully small? It's like the desert swallowing them up as they get further and further from us and begin to shrink off into the distance. Well, you hop off into your time machine now because apart from just being able to transport you instantly to any place in time, your machine can also follow along invisibly any person you wish to observe. And you're curious now about this Mauro Prosperi feller. Three full days and nights pass of you following Mauro Prosperi. And you're just about to lose interest because, frankly, nothing is happening. The guy's just jogging through the desert day by day, stopping and camping at predetermined camps every evening. And while in these little desert camps, not a whole lot happens. 
if you can imagine, well, you don't have to imagine, do you? Because you've been watching him the whole day, these past three days. Been watching him just <laughs> run along under the sun, in the desert. No plants, nothing to look at. There's just sand dunes, blue sky, blazing sun. And when Mauro gets into camp, what you've seen him do every single night is just eat whatever his rations are, collapse, go to sleep because he wants to get up early the next day and get going. So, just as you're about to call it quits on this little trip back to 1994, you eavesdrop a little bit into what Mauro and the other marathoners are talking about there around the, not the campfire, but <laughs> the cactus, I guess. <laughs> They're all camped around the cactus. And you hear them talking about something interesting. What, what was that they said? L let's listen again. Uh-huh. Tomorrow, which is going to be day four, there will apparently be a significant increase in the intensity of what all these fellers here got to go through because it seems that between this camp right here where we're currently at and the next campsite that they'll have to all reach tomorrow, there are 57 miles of bare desert. That's right, 57 miles of bare desert between right here next to Mauro and these fellers here getting ready to call tonight and the next camp that they absolutely have to reach 57 miles 57 miles in the desert an almost complete absence of resources under the blazing sun going up and down sand dunes you begin to appreciate just what a test of endurance this all is you think back to the times when you've taken long casual walks down any ocean beach and you begin to remember the difficulty of what that was like for you you know walking on loose sand and you think about how almost every time you've ever done this you've just ended up taking off your shoes because uh, of that uneven sand, the way the sand turns under your foot and that sort of thing. And even that, taking off your shoes, doesn't really make any things e easier. You know, you use a lot more muscles in your legs and your feet to maintain your balance on sand than you do like on, say, macadam or on firm ground. At best, taking off your shoes just uh, helps your shoes from filling up completely to the brim with sand well you know you've given this a lot of thought now 57 miles that sounds pretty exciting uh, you want to see if Mauro can can pull this off or anybody else for that matter so as everybody here is bedding down for the night in this camp you decide to crawl into your time machine and and do the same thing you can't go back to your own year now nope not now you're too curious to see how Mauro Prosperi handles this ball-bursting mileage tomorrow. So you're going to sleep inside your time machine, invisible to everybody here in the camp, and you're going to stick this out, at least through tomorrow. Here we are. It's day four, April 14th, 1994. And you're sitting around having your coffee. Early in the morning, the other folks around camp, including Mauro, completely oblivious to your presence there. While they scarf down their energy bars and Gatorade and rush off to get as much jogging through the cooler part of the day as they can manage. Boy, I know I've done that a time or two out in the backcountry. You say, before it gets to be nine kajillion degrees, let's, let's get in a few miles. Well, that's what these fellers are doing. And you follow along at a distance between all of them. And you watch the thermometer on the time machine 
which is registering the outside temperature, you watch it as the day goes on hit 114.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 46 degrees Celsius. And Mauro manages to make it to the checkpoint. And you notice that he gets to actually get his allocated small ration of water before he continues jogging along for the rest of that day's journey into the vast dune-covered plains. As you're following him along in your invisible time machine, what you notice is that a storm is kicking up. Yeah, there's these extreme winds. In fact, it's blowing your time machine all over the place. You can imagine how difficult it is for Mauro as he's jogging along through this sandstorm, which is creating these clouds of sand, which is just getting into everything. And it's so bad, in fact, that the organizers of the Sand Marathon actually halt the race for that day. You know it, but Mauro doesn't know it. And you don't have any way to communicate with Mauro, the poor guy. And you notice that as Mauro's been running along, because of this sandstorm, it's affecting visibility. And he can't see that all of the other participants in this marathon have stopped to wait out the storm, and Mauro just runs right on by. He just keeps on running. You're impressed by the fact that he's managed to reach seventh place before all these winds and the sandstorm hit him. And uh, you can guess the reason why he's continuing on. He wants to retain his impressive position in this marathon. There, at that checkpoint where he got his last ration of water, he veered off the trail. Did you notice that when, when he left that checkpoint? I wasn't paying attention. Well, he did. He veered off the trail. And now, as we're following Mauro along, you're noticing just how dark it's starting to get. And you're also starting to notice that Mauro looks a little bit lost. He doesn't know exactly where he's going. In the middle of all these Sahara dunes, he's unable to retrace his steps and find his barrens again. Imagine that sand is shifting all the time, especially in sandstorms. The sandstorm had also blown the small but rough grains of sand up his nose, which found their way into his throat. You know what that led to? You hear him coughing? You know why he's coughing? He's coughing because of all that sand that he breathed up his nose. They, that sand got into his throat, and it's causing cuts and bleeding inside of his throat. You know, you feel a little bad for him, but at the same time, you understand there's no way for him to have avoided these injuries. He, he has to breathe. And the fact that he has to breathe makes it impossible for him not to ingest the particles of this sand. The storm also caused all the flurries of sand to hit his face and causing a bunch of little tiny, irritating, sore cuts to his face. Of course, you didn't have to deal with any of this because you were safe inside your time machine. You watch as Morrow does his best to backtrack. He's looking all over the place, seeing if there's anything recognizable, but it's a desert. That sand dune over there looks exactly like that sand dune up there. And there are no plants. There are no markers to figure out where he's been, where he's going, and all that. But you watch him do his best to do this anyway. And as you're watching, it gets darker and darker and darker. And you realize that all this effort Mauro's making to pick the trail back up is a lost cause. Well, it's a lot cooler now. Sun's down. It's dark. So that's a positive. No scorching heat like in the middle of the day. 
But uh, Mauro doesn't have any rations left. All he has is just a tiny little leftover allocation of food and an empty water bottle. That's all he's got. Here in the dark, middle of the Sahara Desert. After just traveling so many miles, part of those miles in a brutal sandstorm. Well, you watch as time goes by. Mauro doesn't seem too worried yet. Seems like he is pretty confident he'll figure this out. As we watch the sun, the morning sun, come up, we watch Mauro stir, get up, and decide to set off again. And he has no clue where he spent the night, where he's at, or anything like this. Everything looks the same and unfamiliar at the same time. And so he doesn't go very far, you observe, before he stops and he decides to just stay in one place. He does this because this is the advice that the organizers of the Sand Marathon offered everybody in the event that they would get lost. The thinking is that rescue efforts are more likely to be successful if a person just stays where they're at. So we watch Mauro stop on top of a dune, and there he is, twiddling his thumbs, hoping for rescue, looking at his empty bottle, crackling it every once in a while, wishing it had something in it. Hey, hey, wait a second. Do you hear that? Do you hear that sound? It sounds like the blades of a helicopter. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds, and Morrow hears it too. You Look, he's getting up. He's looking all, there it is. He sees the helicopter. And we watch as Mauro watches that rescue helicopter fly directly overhead and not see him. That's right. It doesn't see him. It keeps flying away. And Mauro waits there, desperate, expecting it to return. And it doesn't. Wait a second. What's that he's getting out of his pockets there? Oh, it looks like he's got a map. Well, daggum, Mauro, why didn't you pull that out this morning? He's got a compass, too. And he's setting his map down on the already burning hot sand. Sets the compass down on top of the sand, but, well... Not much is going to come out of that. After all, Mauro doesn't have any points of reference to use his map and his compass with, so the map and the compass don't offer him any advantage whatsoever. And here comes the darkness again. That's right. Burned away in a whole day. Sun is setting. Here comes darkness again. And Mauro decides that he has no option but to go against the advice of staying in one place. After all, the dummy helicopter did not see him, and that was his, his great chance there. So he, you can hardly blame him when he says, you know what, I'm not going to follow the advice of these organizers. I'm going to set off and see what I can do. Well, I'm getting tired. Tireder. Just following Mauro along all this time, aren't you? It would be nice if he could discover something out there that would improve his odds of survival here. We watch him walk. He's pretty downtrodden. And then suddenly, look up there ahead. You see that, that off in the distance there? What is that? Is that a mirage? It looks like some kind of structure. And Mauro sees that structure it must not be a mirage he sees it too 
And as we get closer to the structure, this interesting structure out in the middle of the Sahara Desert, we recognize it as a shrine, a final resting place for Islamic holy men. Yeah, it's a grave, more or less. So we watch Mauro do a little happy dance because he's got shelter now at least. Shelter out here in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Who would have thought that? I didn't think. Did you think that? I didn't. I thought he was cooked. Thank goodness he's come across this tomb, which for him is going to be fantastic as a shelter. His happy dance dies down, though, because his energy is starting to go, and he doesn't have any food, and what's worse, he doesn't have any water. Remember the rule of threes? I've talked about this in the past. They say you can go without food for like three weeks, water for like three days. Um, I don't believe that because I've been without water for a couple days, and it was terrible. I think that three rule uh, is completely relative and based entirely on one's circumstances, where they're at, what they're doing, those sorts of things. But um, there's Mar- Mauro's got something going for him here. While, while he was training for this race, he was able to uh, train for a lack of hydration. So his body is kind of already used to this. So he's not doing too bad just yet. Even so, he ain't looking too good. His health seems to be in decline. We watch Mauro over the next passing days conserve and use the little resources that he's got with him. Not much at all. Got no water. Uh, He does have some wet wipes in his little pouch there. And we watch him sucking the moisture out of those wet wipes. That's pretty smart. Desperation will lead you to do things like that. In the morning, we watch as he goes out of this tomb and he slurps up the dew off of rocks that he finds in the area. But it's not enough. And so we also watch as Mauro resorts to trying to use his own pee, his own urine, as a resource. He even bottles some of this pee for later. It, you know, doing that can lead to organ failure. Uh, there's a reason why you pee that stuff out. It's, it's the stuff your body's trying to get rid of. But it does seem to provide him relief from his intense dehydration. Over the next uh, passing days, we see Mauro do some interesting things. He uh, catches bats and lizards that are also sheltering at this tomb or this shrine. We watch him eat them raw. He also manages to find birds' eggs and insects to eat. Of course, there's some juices and stuff in these insects and these animals. So that provides a little bit of relief. He also has in his pouch some anti-sickness medication, and he takes some of those Every time he gobbles down one of these lizards or bird's eggs or bats, he doesn't sit still for very long. He goes out, carves these great big SOS uh, letters in the burning hot sand uh, that can be seen from the sky. He hears the engine of an airplane. We watch him as he, in a panic, jumps up and runs around trying to figure out how to get that airplane's attention he starts a fire he's got some things in his kit to start a fire gets a fire going and nothing plane keeps flying on by you and i watching all this feel the desperation that mauro is feeling his spirits have really taken a nosedive during this time have you noticed that look at look at how beaten he seems to be in fact, we, we hear him mumbling. He's kind of talking to himself. He's talking about taking his own life. He's that depressed and disappointed 
and beaten down. Especially after that airplane, that helicopter. He thought that that helicopter was his imminent rescue, but didn't pan out. And he's in such misery, he begins to think that uh, maybe death would be quick and painless. He wouldn't suffer. He wouldn't be feeling the suffering that he's feeling right now. But we see him pull out a picture out of his wallet, and it's a picture of his wife. And we see him uh, crying, looking at that picture of his wife, thinking about the impact that his death would would have on her. Of course, another thing he's thinking about is the fact that here in this shrine or this tomb, eventually he's going to be discovered. His body will be discovered, and that makes him feel a little bit better that his wife would have closure in that way. Well, the man pulls out his small pocket knife out of his rucksack, and decides that uh, even though this is going to be tough on his wife, uh, his body will be discovered. And um, the idea of not suffering anymore is, is too attractive. He takes his pocket knife and he cuts his own wrists. It's too bad. Too bad you and I can't holler out at him and tell him not to do that. But you and I are invisible in our invisible time machine. We're just visitors here. So we can't interact with Mauro in any way. We can just watch as he does this. And right before he does it, it's, it's interesting. He goes out on top of this, this tomb or this shrine and uh, fixes his small Italian flag there to the roof of it. Then he goes down inside, does the deed, and we watch him as he blacks out crumples over and we don't know what's going on yet do we is he dead would be nice if we could crawl over there and take his pulse but we can't it's not until we watch the sun come up the next morning that we see Mauro begin to move And he wakes up, and he sits up, and he looks at his wrists. And do you know what? His dehydrated blood has clotted and prevented him from bleeding to death. Well, there's a renewed sense of spirit in Mauro that we can see. He's got a renewed sense of fight, and he takes this as a sign that it's not his time to die just yet. And despite all these odds stacked against him, he decides that he needs to leave this shelter in order to find safety. Time's not on his side anymore. So waiting for rescue is just not really an option for him anymore. He makes his way out of the shrine, notices some mountains in the distance, and he decides to head toward the, towards those mountains. He's thinking that those mountains aren't too very far away from the trail that he veered off from. Because it's so hot, he decides to do this at dusk and dawn to avoid the desert sun. See, that's exactly what I would have told him to do if I could talk to him. Ain't no way I'm doing all my walking underneath the blazing sun when I'm already dying of thirst and all that. So um, we're pretty happy as we see him make this decision, and that's what he does. As he does this in the night and in the early mornings, he stumbles across plants, these rare plants that he comes across from time to time, and he picks them up, squeezes the roots into his mouth, hoping to get some liquid from them, and then, and then he miraculously finds an oasis. He saw it from far off, water glistening in the distance. And you probably saw it at about the same time I did and probably probably at about the same time that Mauro did. I thought it was a mirage. I thought it was just a complete illusion. I'm sure you thought that too. 
But as we get closer in our time machine following Mauro along, we see that it is an actual pool of water, a real puddle of rainwater. Mauro flings himself down beside this water and starts gulping it down. Uh, you can see, though, it's difficult for him to swallow. And he, he vomits it right back up. We watch him as he tries it again, this time slower, taking a break in between to be sure he can keep it all down. And this actually works. And so we watch as Mauro gets his first real drink in about a week. When he finishes, he pulls out his once upon a time urine filled bottle and fills it with water. Oh, can you imagine how delightful he's feeling right now as he's doing this? And he hikes along a little bit farther, stumbling along like a Gary Larson Far Side cartoon. And he spots a sign of life goat droppings. These droppings, these goat droppings are a trail. That's right. If he can just find where the next pile of goat droppings are, he can just follow this all the way back to where these goats are. And that's what we watch him do. And eventually, we watch him go from goat droppings to human footprints. Now he has a tremendous amount of renewed hope climbs a hill stops on top sees a young girl off in the distance tending to animals and we watch as she looks up and notices this dirty disheveled man looking her way and she freaks out she runs away we can't blame her Mauro does not look like he just come from the Ritz uh, as Mauro's calling out to her no no help help uh, to the best of his ability that's uh, no good she runs off and she we watch as she runs off into some tents tents filled with women and she's going in there to warn them that this weird looking man is coming uh but these are older women these are more experienced women and as they come out and they see mauro and the condition that he's in you and i feel relief for mauro as these women all run off to him to tend to him because they understand that this man has been lost in the desert. We can almost taste the goat's milk and the food that they offer him, but he throws it back up. He can't keep it down. And the women, they're not letting him in the tents because he's a, a dude. But they do their best to make him as comfortable as possible outside the tent. Do you see him there laying out some carpets underneath the shade trees and encouraging him to lay down and rest? Well, local military police are informed of this discovery. And we're finding out now that Mauro had unknowingly headed over 180 miles away from the Marathon Trail. He had ended up in Algeria from his starting point in Morocco. At this time, as far as politics go, Algeria-Morocco relations are a bit strained. So we see Mauro's venture in between these two countries initially met with some suspicion by the police. But after discovering that he was missing from the Sand Marathon, they take him to the hospital. And Mauro gets treatment just in time. His liver was on the verge of failure. Look how skinny he is. Had you even noticed that during all these days that we've been with Mauro, just how much weight he's been losing. How, how much you reckon he weighs there? Nope, less. Guess again. 99 pounds. That's what you're looking at right now. A man of 99 pounds. And he's having all this trouble keeping solids down. Thank goodness they're giving him those intravenous fluids so he can get hydrated. 
And now we're watching him get sent back to Italy. And there he is, getting reunited with his family. As with all stories that defy the odds, Mauro's tale of survival was initially met with skepticism. A lot of fellow adventurers and even the founders of uh, the Sand Marathon doubted his story. The founder of the Sand Marathon, Patrick Bauer, said that Mauro's story was a fabrication. You and I know that that's not true because we just followed him along in our invisible time machine. We saw all this for ourselves, didn't we? But this Patrick guy, this dirty old, no good stinking, yellow belly sapsucker, Patrick Bauer, scoffs at the idea that any human could survive over a week in the desert with little to no resources and supplies. Physiologically impossible, he says. Well, he needs to take a ride in our time machine, doesn't he? According to this no good yellow belly sapsucker, he claims that the motive for the exaggerated story was money and fame. But Mauro doesn't take these accusations lightly. In fact, he considers legal action against his doubters, especially this yellow belly sapsucker Patrick Bauer. You know, it'd be easy to disprove if Mauro had inflated or falsified his ordeal. He had the scars. Uh, which were clearly visible whenever he rolled up his sleeves. There was also the long-lasting damage that his body had taken due to extreme conditions. In fact, he, after this, struggles to eat solid foods for a long time after his ordeal in the desert. That was kind of surprising to me, watching him have so much trouble keep those solid foods down. After his rescue he had a liquid only diet for months along with soup that was what he eats uh, as a staple for a long time after this ordeal regardless of whether the uh, organizers of the sand marathon believed mauro or not they did strengthen their regulations for the participants after that to ensure safety They're now given a bigger distress flare if they lose their way. A year after this uh, event, so this is in 1995, we're not going to travel there, you and I, but I'll tell you what happened. You and I, by the way, are now back here in our own time. But back then, the year after Mauro's ordeal, a documentary team went out and found that tomb. And guess what they found in the tomb? A pile of bat skeletons. And the body in a coffin, just like Mauro had said there would be. Some of Mauro's belongings were also there. Four years after the events we just watched, Mauro returned to the Sahara and took part in the sand marathon for a second time. Instead of being fearful or apprehensive about taking part in the very marathon that almost took his life, Mauro felt compelled to finish what he had started there in 1994. He says he has a disease. It's called desert fever. Mauro's love for the desert hasn't quelled. If anything, his love for that dry wilderness has only increased. He's run several more desert marathons, and he returned to the sand marathon five more times over the years, coming in 13th place in 2001. I'm looking up here on the internet to see how old he is now. Mauro Prosperi will turn 70 years old next year. Well, he sounds like he really likes these sorts of things, even despite the hardships that he went through there. I, uh, my experience with the desert is uh, Grand Canyon, and I went uh, specifically, chose to backpack down the bottom of Grand Canyon in January I looked at what all the weather was like there typically the typical weather was like in the canyon and I said well I don't want to do that in the summertime (laughs) it's too brutal the temperatures down there can kill you just the temperatures 
and um, the the need to carry so much water while at the same time carrying other things in down there uh, for a summer trip just does not appeal to me I'm my all my experiences in lush mountain forest that's the the environment that I'm most familiar with and comfortable with and and at ease with and that I feel like uh, I can handle myself best with but I'm, I'm fascinated by the desert and I'm fascinated by stories of the desert probably my favorite movie one of my favorite movies of all time Pro- yeah I'd say the set my second favorite movie of all time is Lawrence of Arabia and it's all because of just the the amazing nature of the of the desert there's a wonderful book about survival I've read about the Sahara Desert it's called uh, Skeletons on the Sahara. If, uh, if that would interest you, look that book up, Skeletons on the Sahara. And it's all about survival, a true story of survival in the Sahara Desert. It's not this story of survival. It's a different story of survival. But I'm curious, what do you guys think of the desert? Do you have any experience with the desert? Does the desert worry you? Is it something that uh, you would risk? I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments, or better yet, on our online community over there on Locals. And folks, that's the show this week. I am dead tired. Now, I ain't as tired as Mauro Prosperi, but I'm pretty tired. So, I'm going to wrap this show up. I'm going to call it a night. I'm going to edit this in the morning and let you guys all see it and weigh in on our little trip there at our time machine. Thanks for joining me here for this episode of The Practical Woodsman. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Take care.